Hi everyone. I'm really nice. How is everybody doing this afternoon? I look really good. It's a big deal. Um, I just want to say thank you to Stephen for all of your work and for that great introduction. Um, and thank you to all of you for having me here. Um, I will not be able to Skype in some of my folks today. There was a really big action that took place last night and uh, people are really still responding to that and dealing with that. But I have some, some uh, video and some audio, so uh, I'll be sharing that, and also I'm gonna try and get you plugged in to people you should be following and taking note of as you leave the space. Um, and I guess before, before I really jump into the presentation and start, I just wanna share something really personal. I guess this whole thing is personal. Um, but last night, I kind of, finally had a moment where I realized that I experienced trauma and that I'm traumatized. And I've always thought that that was weird, like, you know, after this going out and doing work and like, oh, they come back with trauma, like, okay, try like living and being in it. But I, I kind of finally hit me yesterday that I actually went through some trauma um, and I ran into uh, another young woman who went down who was actually in the front lines and there for a very long time. And we were talking and sharing stories about just the ways our bodies responded to it when we were there, and uh, you know, some members of her group actually ended up going to the ER or do care because the body swelled. And I actually remember that when I came back, I had a headache so bad I couldn't really see. You know, we weren't really eating while down there, we weren't really sleeping. Um, we just had these phenomenal physical and emotional reactions. Um, the past couple of weeks, I've been really irritable and just kind of like strangely moody that I haven't been in a while, and I sort of realized that it's all from trauma. And then, uh, Yesterday at a meeting, there was an older white woman, and she kind of just had this really big emotional, passionate outburst to the point of tears, and not necessarily out of sadness, but out of anger and out of exhaustion. And she she was saying that she wants to see change for the little black boys and the little black girls, and it's because when she was growing up as the only white person in her project building. Uh, in the absolute nightmarish hell of poverty in New York City, black people were the only people who showed her love. Um, and she would say, you know, I love, my, I love my children, and I love my grandchildren, and I've been able to raise them to be very tolerant and accepting of everyone, but I had to work my ass off in order to get that. And I love them, but I love the little black boys and the little black girls too who don't stand a chance uh, in this country. And it just, the passion of that just really hit me, and it all came down, <coughs> I wrote a little bit. Um, and I'll share what I wrote briefly, but uh, one thing I said was, I'm, I'm traumatized because history has jumped up and punched me in the throat, um, because it's so in my present, and now I'm gasping for air. I'm traumatized because of how little has changed and how much worse we've gotten, but also because in Ferguson I saw youth, I saw the present rise up with an almost unheard of and supernatural strength and scream at history put up a wall and say, no, stop, enough is enough. I'm traumatized because we failed. We failed to love the little black boys and the little black girls, and not only when they're wearing suits and ties, but also when they have nappy hair and their pants are down low and they don't have shirts on. Why can't we love them? We failed throughout history and through histories, and it's all of us, black and white, and the weight of that failure is if you take it all on, we'll blow you over. And I'm traumatized because I sat in it for a while. I sat in our historic failure that I've also inherited. Um, so in, in going through that, I'm really appreciative of you guys letting me be here and kind of work through this trauma in a, in a relatively productive way. Um, this is my first time really doing that in a setting where I wasn't yelling at people. Um, so thank you for giving me the space and sort of joining me on this journey through this space. Um, because it's important to have these conversations and realize that these things are realities, right? That these are truthful, lived realities. You know, standing in a neighborhood in St. Louis and being told that in the local grammar school, 90% of the fathers are dead or incarcerated, that's a reality. That is real. Um, and just sort of get on that. That's my nephew. Um, it's a little weird picture. He's got fangs because his top teeth are <laughs> <laughs> super adorable. What's his name? His name is uh, Sebastian. 
Thanks, Sebastian. <coughs> and that's him, my brother. Uh, apparently, he's developing his wine taste already. <laughs> Please don't call CPS. Um, but uh, these are my guys. These are these are the black men in my life. These are my favorite, absolutely favorite black men and people. And uh, it really all comes back down to these are also the people that I worry about the most. And after you know, last summer it started off as like, oh, I don't know, Lisa, maybe you're being paranoid. Maybe you're being paranoid. But this past uh, Thanksgiving, I was at my brother's house, and he went outside for something really quickly to like start the car or something, he went out and put it. And he came back through the, the kitchen door, which is essentially like a, a side door or a back door in his house. And he sort of just came in with his hoodie on, and in a moment I was like, oh my god, had you come into someone else's house, they would have shot you. Mm -hmm. And that's my first natural thought uh, of my own brother. Mm -hmm. So. This stuff is real. Uh, there are actual realities, and it gets internalized, and it's uh, it's super intense. So, so there's that. So let me jump into this thing. Um, so, what basically happened was that I had spent the earlier part of the summer watching what was going on in Gaza and working with a group of activists, the local activists here, to respond to that and doing direct action to that. And just being in that space and like kind of witnessing the, the voyeuristic trauma of just like watching and taking in all this information and horror images day in and day out. Um, and then Ferguson happened. And then it was just like, okay, this is too much and this is actually right here. It's not next door, but it might as well be in my backyard compared to how far away Gaza is. Like I have to do something. It just sort of got this, this need to go down. And I started talking to more people and everyone kind of more or less occasionally be like, oh man, we should go there. Oh, we should go there. Oh, we should go there. And then finally I got to the point where I was like, F it, like, let's go. Um, I met some people from the ANSA coalition through doing work with Gaza and I reached out to them for advice, like how do you, you know, what what kind of transportation should we use? Mm -hmm. Get a van. Okay, we'll get a van. Uh, well we're gonna need to fundraise. Okay, so we'll fundraise. And I had a friend whose family was willing to donate a thousand dollars to get us started. Um, and then after that we did a GoFundMe. And basically, long story short, through the course of I think five or six days, we raised twenty-five hundred dollars on top of the thousand that we already had, and it was just like this crazy outpour of support, um, particularly from people and friends who aren't necessarily activists. They're tapped into many causes and haven't really done any any action before. So it was just like really beautiful, amazing outpour of support. We didn't even make a cute video or anything. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it was it was great, and so we raised that money, and we organized our crew, and uh, in our crew we had uh, myself, we had a Palestinian American artist and activist who was an Occupy Wall Street veteran, um, an Indian artist and activist who was also an Occupy Wall Street veteran, um, another Palestinian American artist, digital artist, and visual artist and activist, um, two queer white allies. Uh, one a photographer, one a filmmaker, um, a friend of mine, Reese, and we're from the same hometown, which is Buffalo, New York, and Buffalo for the past however many <laughs> decades has been in the top five of most segregated cities uh, in the country, so we, we had that experience if you wanted to go. Um, I also brought in a local activist from Bedside, another uh, queer black woman, um, and then two activists from the Answer Coalition. One was a black Dominican young man, and the other was a, a young uh, Haitian American woman. Um, and I, I say, I lay out those identities so that you can understand that this was really like, I call it like my little rainbow collective, but it really was uh, a coalition of different identities all coming together to show solidarity for this work and also connecting to this work and connecting it to their work, um, you know, in their own respective realms. So we came together totally independent, not sponsored by any organization. Um, we tried to figure out some sort of agenda. We tried to use Twitter as much as possible. It was interesting. My friend spent like four days calling over 25 different organizations to try to get an idea of what was going on on the ground and really the most that we got came from Twitter, um, mm -hmm. which is sort of a story that shall repeat itself as this goes on. Um, so we got in our little van and we drove down to Missouri, which I absolutely do not recommend. I will never do that again. <laughs> you do decide to drive to Missouri and use a car that can go over 60 miles per hour. <laughs> but we did it. Um, and also, just to remind everyone the time period that we were walking into, um, this is funny, just because I decided to pull up the timeline. 
and I don't know what I expected <laughs> out of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but this is just all, you know, so crazy. Okay, so August 9th, we know that people are <coughs> shot and killed. And then August 10th, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. There was a vigil, and then some thugs came out, and then there was looting, and then, like, they taunted the officers, and then the police responded naturally with their tanks and tear gas and bullets <laughs> and sniper rifles. Naturally. Um, so it, it goes down uh, against the Wall Street Journal. Um, and that's another theme, is like what the media reports and what the media has missed and just all of those nuances. And they're really, really important nuances. Mm -hmm. For example, at the vigil, as people had started to lay out candles and flowers for Mike Brown, the police who started patrolling that area came and like ran over flowers and let their dogs piss on candles and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So I don't know, I would be a little pissed off if that happens to me while I was mourning for my neighbor too. Um, so it goes on, and then this guy came in. And uh, they released Darren Wilson's name on the 15th, uh, the 16th, the state of emergency is claimed. Uh, we have the National Guard on the 18th. This is crazy, the amount of time. It's a very short period of time. Um, this is so funny. And then basically, we get to, I think it was the 25th, which is when Mike Brown was finally buried. So the time that we were going in was, was very interesting because it was when the, you know, a lot of the cameras had been pulled away. Uh, the parents had a chance to bury their child. The, the National Guard was gone, the tanks were gone, all of the big scary stuff that you saw on TV was over. So it's like, why are still people going down there? And the reason people were going down there because this was really the, the time in which the question of, is this a, mo a moment that's going to become a movement was being asked. Um, and I think that the answer is yes, and um, hopefully we'll make that clear in the rest of my presentation. So that's, uh, that's, that's what we know is what was going on and what happened. Um, but I just want to bring in some voices from Ferguson to explain a little bit of how this all started and what we were really walking into. Um, this is the voice of Tef Poe and Tori Wilson. Tef Poe, you should absolutely, 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 absolutely follow on Twitter, follow on Facebook, follow to the end of the earth. This guy is incredible. The work that he's doing is absolutely incredible. Um, and they're still going. And Tori Wilson, he's not on Twitter, but he's around, he's on the ground. He's with the Organization for Black Struggle. He's also with HandsUpUnited.com. So if you want to plug into what's going on down there, um, definitely follow these guys. These guys have been there since the beginning, and this is, this is them talking about how this all sort of when I showed up to the police station, I didn't even know him. You know what I'm saying? It was like, I keep telling the same story over and over. It was like a black power uh, comic book. Every form of black power-ism was there. <laughs> you get the rappers. I, I showed up, I walked up, and I kind of shook my head. I said, damn, I'm a fucking rapper. And then uh, you had the Nation of Islam. You had everybody was there. Like It was like <laughs> the Avengers of black power. Like, <laughs> You had like the church that came in. Everybody made their own dramatic entrance. Like, like the nation came across the street, just walked across the street in straight formation in uniform. The church just hopped out like mad, unorganized, with big hats coming on. Uh, you know what I'm saying? The rappers, they all came out, you know, in, in various moments with their camera, like their TMZ. But it was just wild to watch. So I saw him up there early in the game. And I'm walking through, because you know, I'm a big time local activist. So I'm coming through, we can get, let's get down, brothers, let's get this justice. Who wants some answers? So I see him in the front of the police station, in all black. So I start watching. He had like a folder in his hand, and some people around him. <laughs> and I guess he had the balls of big enough to go in the police station. Yeah. So uh, he came up the station, and people were like, so what's the deal? You got some answers for us. And he snapped on his lady and said, you expect me to work out 400 years of problems in one day. <laughs> so then, I looked at him, I was like, man, this dude crazy. <laughs> so then, he uh, took the envelope, held it in the air, he said, meet me at Canfield Gardens tonight at 8. Everybody, we're all black, and we're going to get some answers. <laughs> and then he walked out. I was like, man, that dude crazy. I didn't even know him at the time. But then you saw stuff like that. It was crazy. Like one black Panther dude was in the middle of the street. He was mad. And he said, everybody march to West Florence. <laughs> so then he started marching by himself. Nobody was marching. And he turned 
turned around and said, Why the hell are y'all not moving? <laughs> And he proceeded to march and everybody started to follow him. I don't know what they didn't way. have a plan at all. But that's just what you saw, man. It was crazy to watch. It was, it was a wild situation to watch. Cool. So that's that's how it started. It was this very organic thing. Um, you know, there were some organizations present. There was the Nation of Islam and there were the churches. For the most part, what you really had were people, individual people, a community coming out and literally just asking why and wanting answers and, and wanting to understand, you know, why did this happen? Um, and then being met with the aggression that they were met with and then just flaring up in, yeah, an absolute rage. Um, but I think it's important to understand where that rage was coming from and why, you know, why A, did they, did they express the rage, but then also why were they so disrupted that they got to the point of everyone just convening and just being out in the streets and doing whatever it felt right in the, in the, in the moment of that. Um, and so there are a couple of answers. Uh, the first one is that the Canfield residential area, is, it's, it's that, it's entirely residential. Um, and this is something that I don't think is really being captured well in media. It's, it's not like here, where if you walk out of your house, you're kind of in the middle of the street, right? If you have an apartment on Murrow Avenue and you walk out of your house, you're kind of in the middle of the street. That separation between purely urban and purely public and residential is not very uh, large. But in Ferguson and in Canfield, essentially, uh, you know, this is this is West Florescent Avenue. This is a very major avenue. This is like Murrow Avenue. Canfield is actually a narrow little drive. And it, it comes from West Florissant, and then it winds back this way, and then eventually, maybe like half a mile or something, you get to the apartment complex. And then there's the apartment complex, and there are apartments everywhere. And surrounding the apartment complex, there are backyards of homes and grassy knolls. It's totally secluded. This is like a residential area. So this is not like somebody got shot in Myrtle Avenue. This is like the police came on this campus and followed someone like off of DeKalb and came on this campus and shot him and left him in the middle of the quad outside. That's what this is like. Um, and also just to complicate things even more, there are barely any sidewalks in, in St. Louis, uh, definitely not on West Florissant. And for the majority of the Canfield Drive stretch, there are no sidewalks, except to where you get to the actual apartment complex, there's sidewalks connecting the apartment buildings. So, if you remember, um, Officer Wilson told the two boys, get the fuck on the sidewalk. <laughs> In order for Mike Brown to have done that, he would have had to fly, because there is no sidewalk. If you also remember their response was, we're almost home, that was their way of saying, we're almost to the apartment where there actually is a sidewalk, not necessarily some sort of snarky retort. So that's just something to think of. Uh, he, the, the police car would have literally had to basically stop these two teenagers away from public space into this residential area. And then also where his body actually was, was right where the apartment complex started. And so you had this young man who was shot and killed in the middle of this residential area where like everyone could see, right? So there are all of these families, children, his family, neighbors, uh, elders, other residents, everyone, everyone just sort of in the middle of their more or less living room with this dead body there that also <coughs> was left there entirely uncovered for four and a half hours under Missouri sun, which by the way is really hot. So basically he was, he was being baked by the sun for four and a half hours as his blood ran through the streets in the middle of this residential neighborhood. Again, imagine if this was all happening right outside of this window and for four and a half hours there was just this body there at the dead of summer. To the point that when they actually did come and get his body, they had to scrape him off of the ground because he had baked into and decomposed into the earth. So that's the trauma that these people all witnessed. And then another thing to remember is that even if everyone wasn't there, there's a, a relatively porous relationship between St. Louis County and all the municipalities there. Um, and, that's, and that's pretty natural, right? That's like, I might have a, a mom or a grandma from St. Louis, and now we were raised over here in Ferguson, but my cousin lives in St. Charles, or da-da-da-da, so you're routinely visiting 
your friends and your family, you know, you're very connected to what's going on. In a sense of like, you know, if something happened in Manhattan or, or Staten Island, it wouldn't necessarily impact us right away, but we're all New Yorkers, right? It's the same thing down there, like they're all from St. Louis. So these are three activists. Uh, the, the woman, the young woman, her name is, uh, her name, she goes by Netta. Uh, on Twitter, she's Netta, but you should actually definitely follow her. She is outrageous, it's totally, totally crazy. Her work is great. I'm pretty sure it's eight A's, it might be seven, it might be nine. I apologize if I lead you astray. Um, but these guys are all from St. Louis. But they have been down in Ferguson ever since day one, every single night and every single day supporting the community. And that's because that relationship is really poor. It's also a really small area, right? Like you can drive 20 minutes and go through like five or six different towns. So the word outside agitator is actually kind of BS because the police on the force who are protecting Ferguson, they themselves are probably outside agitators. The mayor of Ferguson doesn't live in Ferguson. So everyone at this point is actually an outside agitator. Um, so, so you have this trauma that's then also spreading through this community that is greater than just that, that uh, residential complex. And then finally, you have this really ugly history of oppression um, between the police and the people of Ferguson. And I'm sure by now you've heard some of these things of like how the police do, you know, they over, over give warrants, they're, you know, you can get arrested for anything, you're, you're likely to get a ticket for anything, like they basically have this system of extortion. Um, and that's very real. And when you talk to people down there, you know, usually you'll hear people be like, oh, I don't go to that street or that street at night because like that gang might be out there or like it gets a little dicey or I'm not safe because like a woman. Down there, it's literally like, I can't drive A, B, and C at this hour because I will get pulled over. Not because I will get mugged or because, you know, I might get whatever, but because the police will harass me. Like that is their way of life down there because what you're reading about now is actually so real and so prevalent and one of the ways um, a protester explained it to me was, you know, they'll go in and they'll tap a community, right? Like last year they issued more warrants than there were uh, people in the city of Ferguson. They'll go in and they'll do that. And then once they get all the money and once they get all the tap the whole community as much as they can, they have amnesty days. Like every five or six months where literally they're like, just kidding, come in, get your sweet white clean <laughs> RV, and you move on. So, there is a lot of like a really bad history of, of just aggression um, between those two, those three communities. So you take all of those things, you know, you take the trauma, you take that this impacts more people than just who live in that residential complex, and you take this thing of <coughs> being harassed by the police as a community for so long, and you get the rage that was sparked by all of this, and you get the people who are down there and out in the streets. Um, so I'm going to shift a little bit and, and tell some stories of uh, essentially the weekend that I spent there. Um, the first, the first big thing is that that Saturday um, there was a march and protest in front of the police station, and it's a little confusing because there's because there's so much going on. Um, you know, at first I heard about it on Twitter as a march to the police station, somebody else heard about it as a march to this park, and so by the time we actually um, rolled up to this march, we were trying to find the march and there were people outside marshalling and pushing people towards the police station. You kind of go up to people and you're like, hey, are you a part of blah, blah, blah? No. Who's doing this? I don't know. What are we supposed to do? Go to the police station. Like, just individual people totally done with any sort of organizational agenda, like pushing the crowd and directing the crowd, and the crowd really following what the people want in that moment, and then being to be supported by the organizations in that moment. Um, so that, when we finally got down, my group, when we finally got down to the march, that's what happened, and we sort of got pushed to uh, the police station, and that's where I really saw like, a lot of incredible things. Um, and this is a picture of the 